Hi, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Recently, I had the opportunity to interview Dr. Neil Blitz. Dr. Blitz is a foot surgeon, a reconstructive foot surgeon in New York. He holds the position of chief of foot surgery at Bronx Lebanon Hospital in New York. Dr. Blitz also maintains a private practice at 56 and Park Avenue in Manhattan. Dr. Blitz did his training at Swedish Hospital in Seattle, Washington, and from there, an Acta Orthopedica Fellowship in Dresden, Germany. Dr. Blitz has authored many peer-reviewed articles as well as uh, contributed to the Huffington Post on foot health. Join with me now while we discuss bunion surgery with Dr. Blitz. And when they show up in your office on the first visit, how are you going to evaluate that person? So for the most part, on a first visit, when somebody comes in for bunion surgery, uh, we evaluate them in a few ways. Uh, the first thing we do, of course, is we look at their overall structure of their foot uh, and just the general appearance. The se second thing that we look at is uh, how the foot functions. So uh, we do a physical examination, check the mobility of the foot, um, check the size of the bunion and the quality of the, the range of motion of the big toe joint. The third thing that we do is we get x-rays to look at the, the structure of the foot on the inside. Now, do we have a good idea of what causes bunions uh, in this day and age? Is this something that is developmental, genetic, something that's coming from shoe wear? What leads to a bunion? So there are several causes of bunions. Uh, most commonly, people think that uh, bunions are genetic, and that's true. I mean, if, you're, if your grandmother had a bunion, there's a good chance that you could, you could inherit a bunion. Uh, so there is some sort of genetic uh, predilection or predisposition to developing bunions, but it's not, it's not 100%, okay? Uh, shoe gear is another thing that causes bunions, which is why we see a lot more bunions in women, okay? Uh, women tend to wear more high-heeled shoes, which sort of uh, flattens out the foot and creates instability in the foot in general. And also, the, the pointy-toed shoes of the foot also uh, cause a bunion in that, uh, think of the foot as a piece of clay where the pointy-toed shoes uh, really sort of starts molding the, the shape of the foot or the big toe to sort of push over towards the other toes, and that in and of itself uh, will cause a bunion. Well, let's talk a little bit about shoe wear. Is there any ideal shoe that you would recommend that people should wear to prevent bunions? As far as shoe gear goes to uh, prevent bunions, there really is no ideal shoe. Uh, what I usually tell patients is you want to sort of prevent the progression of a bunion. So with that, you want to avoid shoes that we know can contribute to a bunion, such as high heels and really those pointy toe shoes. Uh, the other thing that I recommend to, to women who are very concerned about being stylish and protecting their feet is to uh, limit their time in high heels. So uh, a popular thing to do is to, is to wear your high heels, let's say, at work or at a function, and then put your other shoes on or your, your sort of more sensible shoes uh, on uh, in, in your travel in your travel uh, plans, uh, such as if you're walking, uh, taking the subway, or, or, or driving, um, so, so that's important. Uh, as far as um, sort of an ideal shoe, I usually recommend you want a shoe with some some real structure to it and some stability. Okay, and you want shoes with a wide toe box. You don't want a shoe in general that you could just sort of fold up into a ball, because um, that doesn't really offer a lot of structure for somebody with a bunion. Now I'm going to take the other side of that too and say that it's probably a good idea to, to wear a shoe, uh, excuse me, to also go barefoot at times. And a lot of foot doctors will tell you, oh no, don't do that. Okay? But I'm a big believer of actually getting the muscles of the foot to work. And you don't want the muscles of the foot to become completely sort of inactive or dependent. So if you're barefoot, that actually causes the, the muscles of the foot to work a little bit more. So it's a good idea to do that too, but you don't want to live barefoot and you don't want to live in a, in a, in a high heel shoe. Let's talk a little bit more about evaluation of the foot. Do you, do you recommend any special test on that first visit? I'm assuming you get x-rays on the first visit, but what about any special tests like MRI scan, CAT scans, any of those things necessary? On your first evaluation when seeing a doctor for a bunion, the most common thing you'll get is an x-ray, okay? Um, and that's all you pretty much need. You don't need to have a special test like an MRI or a CAT scan or a bone scan. Every now and again, if the surgeon or your doctor thinks there's something greater going on in your foot, you may get an MRI, but usually it's not the case and not necessary. Uh, a simple standing x-ray is all you need. Well, let's talk a little bit about early treatment for bunions. When you see this person, you've done your assessment, you've done the necessary tests, and you're pretty convinced you know what's going on. How are you going to start in terms of treatment recommendations with that patient? 
So the treatment for uh, bunions um, uh, typically is divided into surgical options and non-surgical options. And we typically start with the non-surgical things first. And when we're talking about non-surgical options, the first things that come to mind are um, oral anti-inflammatories such as over-the-counter uh, Motrin and even prescription uh, Motrin when the bunion itself is very inflamed. Um, other simple things that I try to do are things that patients can pick up in the drugstore or in the pharmacy such as um, uh, simple arch supports, over-the-counter arch supports to give some structure to the foot to see if that doesn't help alleviate some of the symptoms. Another thing that's, that we try is uh, uh, pads on the bunion area and that can, can really help out a lot, especially if women are getting a lot of sort of irritation or, or men are getting a lot of irritation from shoe, although it's from shoe gear, but it's more common in women. And simple pads like moleskin work really good. Another thing that we try are spacers between the toes between the first and second toe. Um, there are silicone spacers that you can put right between those toes and that holds the toes apart. And that does a really good job at at least alleviating some of the pressure um, at the big toe joint, especially if you have more sort of big toe joint uh, pain from your bunion. Uh, a third thing that we can do, which is a little bit more invasive, is sometimes your doctor can give you injections around the big toe joint if it's really inflamed and red. Uh, and that can sort of decrease what's called a, a bursa, just an inflamed area. Um, but th that's pretty much the non-surgical uh, treatment for, for bunions. Um, every now and again, we can try physical therapy, and that's really good if the muscles of the foot are weak. But for the most part, um, uh, the, the non-surgical uh, options uh, involve uh, anti-inflammatories, arch supports, um, change in shoe gear, uh, sh uh, activity modifications, and um, uh, simple shoe gear modifications such as padding and splints. And, and how do you know when this fails? When, when patients come back and, and they say, I'm not satisfied that we're making progress with non-operative treatment, what leads you to have the discussion about surgical options? So patients usually lead the discussion for surgery. Uh, for the most part, they'll have tried some, some amount of, of non-surgical options such as padding, uh, shoe, some shoe gear changes, some lifestyle activity changes, and then you get to a point when they say, look, I've tried all these things and I'm thinking about a surgery, what are my options? Um, more often than not, or at least um, it's not my common practice to, to tell patients you need a bunion surgery because you've got a bunion. Um, that, that doesn't really happen too often. So usually it's the patients um, uh, bringing on the discussion. And when you start having that discussion, what are the sorts of things that you begin to talk with patients about in terms of the surgical options? So let's talk about bunion surgery. So the first thing that a surgeon needs to do is evaluate the foot and figure out exactly how big the bunion is. So bunions are divided into small, medium, and large. Okay, And the surgery for a small bunion is very different than the surgery for a large bunion. Uh, the recovery for a small bunion is also quite different than the surgery of a, of a large bunion, and that's even changed quite a bit today, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Okay. So for the most part, uh, surgery involves shaving down a little bit of bone at the big toe joint, okay? So there is sometimes a little bit of extra bone there, so that's shaved off. But that's not the bulk of the procedure. The bulk of bunion surgery comes from just how the bone and how the joint is re re sort of uh, recreated and put into a proper sort of better position, okay? Um, so when you have a small bunion, a surgeon will go ahead and do a special bone cut near the big toe joint to move over just the top part of the bone, okay, and realign the big toe and also realign just the top part of the bone. They're not actually fixing the entire deviated bone, okay. Now when you have a large bunion, the surgery is a little different. You actually have to go a little further back on the bone and you have to swing the entire bone back into the right position or the correct position, okay. And you also do some work over at the big toe joint as well to to fix some soft tissue stuff that goes on there, okay? But at the back part of the bone, there is a bone mending procedure called the lapidus bunionectomy, which is a bone fusion, and um, that's, that's done to hold the bone in place, and that's more of a, a sort of a, a more structural realignment of the foot, okay? Now, I'm aware that you've actually created a new procedure or at least a modification of, of the lapidus procedure that, that I think you've termed the bunionplasty. Can you explain a little bit about that? So in general, while there were over 150 operations that have been described for bunion surgery, surgeons really just use a handful of, of procedures today. 
Again, it's either a, a bone cut near the big toe joint, uh, sometimes a bone cut involving that entire bone, which again happens, happens also. And then the third way is to do a bone mending procedure called the lapidus bunionectomy to swing the entire bone back into the proper position. So I want to talk to you about what a bunionplasty is. And a bunionplasty is a plastic surgery approach to bunion surgery. Okay? And what does that really mean? It means that we take a specific uh, care or specific attention to the, the cosmetic aspect or the cosmetic outcome of the procedure. Okay? So we still accomplish the same bone work that needs to be done, but we do it in such a way that we have an improved cosmetic out, uh, outcome. Okay? So this is done with three ways. Minimal incision. This is done with, with um, uh, a plastic surgery techniques where we sort of minimize the scarring. And the third way is what's called hidden incision. Okay? Um, the hidden incision uh, is, is, is a type of bunionplasty where the, the incision is no longer put on the top of the foot, it's put on the, so the inside of the foot, and it's hidden along the border of the foot. Now, surgeons have been doing that for quite some time, but they've been doing it for the small bunions, not so much for the large bunions. Now, um, with the use of uh, uh, sort of uh, internal fixation device, devices and modern techniques that happen on the inside of the bones, uh, surgeons can do the bone work um, uh, from, from the side, uh, so it makes their life easier, but it actually makes it makes the ability to do this bunion plasty or this hidden incision from the inside uh, with larger bunions. So, um, so again, a bunion plasty is a plastic surgery approach for bunions. Now, are you finding that some of the benefits are earlier mobilization? Do you get over this operation better, or is it just more cosmetic? So, as far as the recovery goes after bunion surgery and bunion plasty, uh, it's pretty much divided into um, walking right away or not walking right away. Uh, the older techniques involved casting crutches, uh, which is not the case anymore. So pretty much the school of thought is if you have, or has been, if you had a mild bunion, you were able to walk right away in a small surgical shoe. If you had a larger bunion, that meant surgeons had to do more bone work, okay? And then they had, a, and because of that, they had to put you in a casting crutches for, for uh, six to eight weeks. Nowadays, uh, with, with uh, these specialized techniques, uh, surgeons can get patients moving a lot quicker than they used to. Uh, I have been a pioneer in bunion surgery for the last 10 years and actually have uh, been involved in the development of uh, certain medical uh, instrumentation and implants that uh, sort of hold the bone steady uh, during the healing process. And with the use of this, of this I'm able to get the patients walking uh, immediately after the surgery no matter the size of the bunion. So in my practice, the, the cast and crutches is pretty much uh, gone. Uh, all patients after bunion surgery, for the most part, are walking right away in a post-operative shoe, which is a small surgical shoe limited to the, to the foot. Now, this doesn't mean that they're walking and, 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 and doing uh, things like going to the supermarket and, and um, um, uh, going shopping in Macy's, I mean, you know, maybe the supermarket, but uh, patients are getting around, they're not running around, and that's how I like to put it. Uh, and that's been a big change because bunion surgery is, is not what it used to be. Um, the casting crutches, at least in my experience, uh, are, are not anymore. Uh, most patients, again, are, are, are getting around with, with a cane or crutch for support. Now, the healing for bunion surgery is about six weeks. Well, let's talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of the surgery. This, I'm assuming, is something that is done as an outpatient. You don't have to stay the night in the hospital. No, um, bunion surgery is not done as an inpatient procedure, uh, at least uh, not in the United States. Uh, bunion surgery is an outpatient procedure. That means you go home the same day. The anesthesia for bunion surgery is usually local with sedation. Um, at sometimes, uh, 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 we'll recommend a, a more involved anesthe anesthetic, such as a general, uh, and that's if uh, a lot more bone work is being done. Um, but for the most part, it's, it's uh, local with sedation uh, with uh, sometimes general. And what type of anesthesia does this require? Is it a general anesthetic, a local anesthetic? The type of anesthesia used for bunion surgery is usually local with sedation. Sometimes we'll use a more involved anesthesia such as general, uh, but for the most part that's reserved when more bone work is being done. And how long should a patient expect to be on crutches or some type of, of support as they leave the hospital? When patients are leaving the hospital after bunion surgery, they're usually walking in a, a small surgical shoe. Okay? 
Now they can be given uh, crutches and or, and or a cane uh, for more support, but uh, they're usually walking on it with um, some assistive aid. Uh, the days of casting and crutches are, are, are much less common uh, and, and in my practice and my experience are, are, are over for bunion surgery, but um, uh, that's how they're leaving the hospital. Now it takes six weeks for the bone to mend and patients are somewhat uh, limited in that they're not doing too much during that time, but they're usually able to return to work uh, depending on their job, especially a, a sort of a more sedentary job uh, within a week or two uh, after the surgery. Now it takes about, um, uh, again, six weeks for the bone to mend, and it's about two months before you're back to some, some really good sort of everyday activities and, and regular shoes um, and really getting around. Uh, three months before you're uh, running around, and six months before you forgot you even had the surgery. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion about bunions and, and your new technique called bunion plasty to actually address this deformity. Is there anything that you think patients need to know that we haven't discussed up to this point in the conversation? As far as patients are concerned, if I was a patient looking to have bunion surgery, I would definitely go to the internet and uh, at least sort of learn about bunion surgery and try to understand uh, what techniques and procedures are available so that you're more educated, okay? I think uh, the internet has uh, changed medicine in general and you can get a lot of information. So I think it's always a good idea to be informed and I think it's, it's important to get the, sort of the latest and, and best techniques um, uh, in uh, uh, healthcare in general, especially when it comes to bunion surgery because the surgery today is very different than it looked, I will tell you, three and five years ago. So um, try to find somebody uh, that is uh, practicing to, to the most modern care. Well, I want to thank you for discussing this with patients today. I'm sure our viewers will appreciate it, and I look forward to further discussions in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.